Welcome to In the Can on this first day of the Sundance Film Festival. It is Thursday, January 20th. I'm your host, Christine Napier, and I'll have co-host Katie Wang out here joining me today from Park City Film. In just a moment, we're very excited to talk to some directors, actors about some great films that you can watch virtually throughout our festival. All of our individuals we'll be interviewing are joining us virtually as well. We're excited to be here and happy that you're with us as well. We are going to take a look outside and see exactly who we'll be talking to today. Beautiful cold morning. We've got a change coming in our weather, so be prepared for that snow to fall tomorrow. We're all very excited about that. But in the meantime, let's focus on what we're talking about today. At first, we're going to talk about camping and vacation time before we get into our Sundance coverage. After that, I'll be speaking to the director and actor in the film Babysitter, followed by Mars One. Katie Wang will be sitting down with them to find out all about that incredible film. And Katie will also be speaking with some individuals from a long line of ladies, followed by an Indie Entertainment Showcase. I'll be talking to Bobby Dwyer, an executive producer who will be participating in that showcase. Find out exactly what that is and learn more about Bobby and some of the incredible films she has worked on. Followed by ASCAP, I'll be talking with musician John Doe all about his performance, his virtual performance now with the ASCAP Music Cafe. Followed by Katie and I are going to sit down at the end of the show and overview some of the great films you can watch during the festival. We are going to take a quick break though and no, before we take a break, actually, we are going to focus on something different. Camping has been all of the rage recently. In fact, many people are heading towards vacations that are outdoors. They feel safe and right in this time. And here to tell us all about this is Michael Scheinman, CEO of Camp Spot. Michael, thanks for being here today. How are you? Thanks for having me, Christine. I'm doing well. So tell me more about the popularity of camping and these outdoor vacations. Yeah, so you hit the nail on the head. I mean, when the pandemic hit, people were looking for safer travel activities, things they could do outdoors with friends and family, where they could really control the environment around them. And camping checked all the boxes. So we saw this huge surge in popularity. Just to give you a sense, between the summer of 2020 and the summer of 2021, we saw reservations on the Camp Spot platform nearly triple. And even as traditional travel starts to return to some semblance of normalcy, we're not seeing camping slow down one bit. It's like people got this taste for the outdoors and they just want more of it. What are people looking for in campsites as they choose and decide where to go and where to camp? So the number one most requested amenity is high quality bathhouses and, and showers, which is no surprise, especially if folks have been on the road for a long time getting to their campsite. And then the second highest priority for campers is activities for families. You definitely want to keep the kids occupied if you're taking them with you. Um, and then third most popular is uh, proximity to adventures outside of the campsite itself. And Camp Spot recently had their first annual Camp Spot Awards. Tell me about some of the top destinations for camping here across the country that won some of your awards. Absolutely. So if you're not familiar with Camp Spot, we are the largest booking platform for private campgrounds and RV parks in North America. We've got over 140,000 campsites that are all instantly bookable. And this year we decided to showcase some of the best of the best in categories like best for families, best views, best for first time campers. And we enlisted the help of some industry expert judges to help us identify what we unveiled as the Camp Spot Awards. So there are so many great camping destinations all throughout the country. In fact, not too far from you all is um, one great campground called the Dark Sky RV Campground. It's, it's about two hours from Salt Lake City area. And it's probably one of the most unique campgrounds I've ever seen, along with their incredible views. They've got luxurious amenities like private bath suites, outdoor showers, open terrace lounge, meditation areas, a dog park, and more. So it's it's really got everything that you could hope for in not just a camping trip, but a vacation of any sort. Oh, it absolutely does. And right, pretty much in our backyard. Do you have any tips for planning our next vacation, especially when we're camping and heading outdoors? So the flip side of camping being so popular right now is that campgrounds are selling out. We already have more than 50% of 50% uh, growth in reservations for 4th of July, Memorial Day, Labor Day, those big camping holidays. And so you want to book early. 
Uh, I would also encourage viewers to look outside of those state parks and national parks, which most of us associate with camping. Uh, those are great options, but they sell out even faster. So I encourage folks to look outside of the state parks and national parks where there's sometimes really nice private campgrounds that have the same proximity to those attractions, but maybe more amenities and a, a more well-rounded experience. And as we get ready for these big vacations that we're hoping to take this summer and wanting to start plan, where can we get more information about all of this? So yeah, you can definitely get more information on our website at www.campspot.com, that's C-A-M-P-S-P-O-T.com, or download our mobile app on either of the major app stores. We really hope your viewers will check us out so that we can help them plan and book their next camping adventure. Well, thank you so much, Michael, for joining us today from Camp Spot. Really appreciate your tips all about planning our next outdoor vacation. Really excited to do just that and head outside and start camping. We'll be back here right after this. Welcome back. Right now we are going to focus on the film Babysitter. It is in the midnight selection of the film festival this year. We are talking right now to Monet Shakri. She is the actor and director of this film. Monet, thanks for being here today. How are you? I'm good. You? Doing well. I know. I believe you're joining us from Canada. Is that correct? Yeah, that's true. I'm in Montreal right now. Well, thank you for taking time to speak with us. Congratulations on this film being in the festival. Now, Babysitter started out as a play and you decided to create a film. Do you remember the moment that you made that decision and you just knew that you had to make this as a film? Actually, at this meeting, um, I mean, a lot of people were, were talking about uh, Catherine, the, the screenwriter and the, and the playwright, uh, to me. And, and they say, oh, you should meet. Uh, I think you have like something in common and it would be interesting for you to, uh, to meet each other. So uh, a week before I met her, I saw her, her play uh, Babysitter in Montreal. And I was uh, very fascinated and, and I, it was so funny and clever. And when I met Catherine, I told her like, it was, it, if we have a project to do together, it would be uh, this um, this play that we could um, transform in, in movie. And she was actually working on the screenplay, so it was like meant to be. And describe for us the premise of this film. Um, it's it's a it's a, it's a long story because there's a lot of, of character, but the, the 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 main story is a couple that struggle with the fact that they have a, a newborn baby, and uh, with a like a, a thing that happened at the beginning of the movie that I won't tell, uh, something like a collapse in their relationship in in the the world of this couple. So uh, and they're gonna hire a babysitter who's gonna change their life. It's a very smart, very funny. I watched the film and enjoyed it very much. And I want to make sure to point out that you are the director of this film, but you also star in it. What are some of the challenges of playing both of those roles? Well, I'm an actor, like uh, I, I began my, my career as an actor, uh, but I didn't like when I started to, to direct and uh, write and direct, I, I didn't have this, this idea of, of playing in my movies. Um, but since, like, I had this project for for a, a year in my in my hand, and the, the producer and Catherine, the, the screenwriter, told me uh, maybe you should like play uh, one of the character, uh, and I was I wasn't thinking of that because when I direct, I don't have this this idea of of, uh, of playing in my my own movies. But since I didn't write it, I was like maybe maybe I can do it, and it's going to be a good challenge for me. Uh, as a as a director to to see if I'm I can handle uh, uh, both of the of the of the work uh, as an actor and director and that's why I, I decided to uh, to 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 take this challenge. You play Nadine in this film. You are a new mom, and you do an incredible job. You deliver some very smart, witty lines deadpan but it's hilarious at the same time your character is also dealing with some really big emotional things and you portray that just incredibly well have you ever played a character like nadine before this very dramatic but also comedy character uh well, I'm I'm known for that kind of, of uh, duality between uh, drama and and comedy as an actor, but um, 
I think that the, the biggest challenge for her it, it was the fact that uh, we we talk in a comedy about depression and postpartum uh, um, struggling, and it's not a, a subject that we uh, usually um, maybe um, talk about it in in, in movies. Um, so it was the biggest challenge. It was to to be um, like subtle because uh, a lot of like there's a lot of flamboyancy in the in in the other characters. So I needed this like I like the fact that Nadine is like kind of a low profile and and that's that's how I, I wanted to to uh, describe like depression and 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 postpartum like not to be like in a in a um, like clowny uh, way of of uh, describe it, but just like. A, um, you know, like in in this, she's in the shell, you know, and and you know, I like the the fact that it's it's uh, it's about depression, but very like solely. You do an incredible job doing just that. This character, when we focus on the film and how it is done, it's beautifully created. I want to ask you about your use of color and how that's juxtaposed to some of the darker scenes, and what made you decide to choose those different palettes. Um. I think I, I always have this like when if you, if uh, people see my other movie like I always have this uh, a love for for a kind of a vintage look and I work in in, in film in, in um so I don't know I, I think it was it was meant to be for this movie especially to have like this kind of like um um not out of control color but like in a kind of fantasy world you know so that's why I could like uh, be a uh, uh, very imaginative uh, with the with the, the color and the, the lens that we use. We use like uh, old lens and and uh, a thing called star filter, which brings this this very vaporous uh, vintage look uh, of the movie. Well, it's a very relatable film. I think audiences will relate to one of the characters at least within this context of what's going on. It's a film about many things, as you mentioned. It's about Me Too movement. It's about introspection, growth, change, postpartum depression, motherhood, becoming new parents, all these things happening. What do you personally hope that the legacy of this film will be? Um, when I when I do movies, like I, I never uh, think of like what people's gonna think or what people should think. Uh, that's why I'm an artist. Uh, uh, if if I would thing that I, I would write like a essay or a, I would be in a, in a social politic uh, studies. But um, I think I, I just want to like ask question uh, to people like, are we in a, in a place where we should be like in all those those subjects? Like it's it's more like an open uh, reflection than, than something very specific that I want that people uh, think. But I hope this, they're going to laugh. <laughs> They absolutely will. I know I very much, once again, enjoyed the film. Thank you so much, Monisha Cree, for joining us today. Thank you. Very excited for audiences to see this film, to talk about it, because there's so much that will be said and needs to be said with everything that goes on just beautifully done. You can watch Babysitter during the midnight selection of the Sundance Film Festival. We'll be back here on In the Can right after this. of the Sundance 2022 Sundance Film Festival. Uh, we're excited this morning to be joined by Gabriel Martins joining us from Brazil. He is the writer and director of Martes Um, uh, Mars One, which is premiering this evening in the opening section of, opening night section of the Sundance Film Festival. Gabriel, do we have you here? Good Hi morning. Guys. Thanks for joining us here. I'm very excited to see your film. Congratulations. Uh, this is your sophomore film. And this is a beautiful film, coming of age film. We'd love to have you tell us a little bit about it. And then we do have a clip from the film that we'll show. So maybe you can in, uh, set that scene up for us as you talk a little bit about what the film is about. Yeah, the film High Park City, first of all, thank you so much for having me here. Uh, the film tells a story about a Brazilian family. The younger son is David, who is a very uh, good uh, soccer player and his father dreams of him being the next big uh, star soccer player from Brazil. But David actually wants to be an astrophysicist and participate in the mission Mars One to colonize Mars. So we follow this family in the struggles and uh, also trying to deal with uh, issues of not having enough money, 
trying to keep their jobs in a struggling time in Brazil. So it's, it's basically a film about hopes and dreams. Excellent. So we've got a clip from the film, so we can see that and see a little bit of what you're talking about here for the film. Nina, você acha que o papai ia ficar bravo se eu não quisesse mais jogar futebol? Você não quer jogar bola, não? Ah, não sei se eu quero virar jogador profissional, não. Então fala com o papai, Devinho. Ele não pode te obrigar a fazer nada, não. Não é que eu quero parar de jogar bola. Porque eu penso em fazer outras coisas também. It's exciting to see this film, so congratulations on being able to bring it uh, to our opening night selection here at Sundance. Um, What's interesting I find when you watch the clip is that in some ways it's such an ordinary story about a family, but the dreams are so big. You know, the, the aspiration of, this, uh, of David, it's so exciting, but also, you know, it's, it's a film for you, right, that's close to home. This is shot, as I understand it, um, in the town where you grew up. Um, so in some ways it's a very personal film, but it's also kind of quietly revolutionary as well. Um, not many films that come to the United States are about uh, the Afro-Latinx experience. And so if you could talk to a little bit about that, of why you chose to portray the film in the way that you did, um, and you know, how this is perhaps changing uh, subtly, or maybe not so subtly, the film industry and films that are coming um, to the United States from other countries. Yeah, I think, as you said, it's very close to home because uh, I also, I, I wanted to do films since I was like seven, eight years old. And I am a, I'm a, a black man. I used to be a black kid that grew up in a poor neighborhood. So that was a very far away dream for me to become a filmmaker. So I can relate to what David is going through, this character, because I think uh, we have to dare to dream this, those kind of things. And I think this film is what this energy is all about, of dreaming big and trying to reach the unreachable. And I guess when I uh, make, decide to make this film about this family, I was trying to think about that, especially in a moment where, especially in Brazil, everything seems so low because we have very low expectations. The country is in a very turbulent place, polit politically speaking and also socially speaking. So to make a film like that is always to have kind of bold statement about what our community of Brazilian community, what the Afro community we can be and that we need to dream big. So to have this kind of film and go into Sundance, which is a big film festival, which I always followed and always hoped to be part of, uh, it's kind of a way uh, this dream of me as a young kid coming true, uh, having be able to, to have this profession and making these films as a career. And so to have this story uh, kind of hits as a personal goal for me, but also as an inspiration for uh, everything Brazilian cinema can be, even though we're struggling right now uh, to be alive, uh, our, our cinema, but I think this film brings an energy of overcoming the struggles and obstacles that we find in life. So I guess this is my feeling that I have right now in this day of premiere, is a feeling of gratitude, but at the same time a feeling of uh, uh, the power of dreams in a way. 
And so my understanding is that in Brazil, I mean, you're certainly your film got funded. It was made a couple of years ago, um, but the, the funding, the current government is not as supportive of the arts. Do you think that by premiering at Sundance is your, I mean, certainly your hope, but do you see a change shifting towards perhaps more support for the arts with this great success that you're having? What does that kind of look like with the, the film industry in Brazil as this kind of paving a new path forward? Yeah, I hope so, because uh, this film was financed for uh, an affirmative action fund that happened only once, unfortunately. So this, I think, is kind of a portrait of what uh, the situation is in Brazil's culture right now in the Bolsonaro's government. And I hope the success of this film and by proving that we can fund these films and they can circle around the world, we can tell beautiful stories with the support, I think uh, may send a message to our population, our government and uh, everything, everyone related to culture that we, we can let this go. We need to uh, keep supporting, we need to go come back with the uh, with the funds and everything that we need to make these films because we are very dependent of, on public funding. So uh, we have a beautiful generation of black filmmakers in Brazil. And I think uh, we need the support so we can have films like Mars One not be an exception. So we can have more content like that going around and telling beautiful stories. Well, congratulations. I think you've done an exceptional job in what a, you know, you know, to be able to be and not not just selected for the Sundance Film Festival, but to be the opening night film. Um, you know, I hope that it has the impact that you're talking about and certainly look forward to having folks see it here at the Sundance Film Festival um, from the, the comfort of their homes, their virtual cinemas. Um, so congratulations, uh, Gabriel, and thank you for joining us today. Thank you so much, guys. Enjoy the festival. Welcome back to In the Can, coverage of the 2022 Sundance Film Festival. Uh, we are joined here this morning by Jandine Tome and Rika Tabachi um, from Long Line of Ladies. This is a nonfiction film that's premiering in the short section of the film festival. And interestingly, this is one of um, nine films that are by indigenous filmmakers in the festival this year, which is the most that we've ever had. So that's really exciting. So welcome to the show and thanks for being here. Hi, Christine. Uh, it's great to be here. Rika, I think, is not here right now, but I'm sure she'll join in later. But um, yeah, it's one of nine Indigenous films, and it's super exciting to be playing alongside such great shorts. Excellent. Um, would you mind telling us a little bit about your film? We do have a trailer for the film that we'll show in a minute, so maybe you can kind of set that up for us. And, you know, this is a coming of age story, which is, uh, you know, quite interesting, but it's, it's a story that's not even in the community that it's from. Um, it's kind of an emergent story uh, of a coming of age ceremony of the Karak and Yurok tribes from Northern California. Yeah, so the main uh, subject in the film is Ati, and she is about to go through her coming of age ceremony, which is called the Ihuk in the Karak and Yurok tribes. And basically, she um, it's just about the preparation and how community comes together to uplift a young woman. Excellent. Well, we have a trailer for the film that we'll show here, and we can get a little taste of the film. Ty sent the snap to our whole group chat and was like, guess who started her period? <laughs> but then I was like, wait, this means that I'm going to have my flower dance this year. Okay. <laughs> my fingers. <laughs> so you're blinded for four days, and uh, then we remove your tom, and you're reborn as a woman. When they ask us, well, what was your flower dance like? And then you're like, well, I didn't have one, and then it's like, well, why? Get as a girl and I'm out of work. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> well, that's what we do. We perfected that process. All right, Cindy, well, I love you. You're going to do great, okay? Okay. Love you. Okay, see you in the morning. See you. So, so many questions from seeing this trailer. Um, just a beautifully shot film and you know, a fascinating story. Can you tell us a little bit about, I mean, one, the title I think is quite interesting, Long Line of Ladies, and then how did you come to this story? Um, my understanding is that you're a, a, a Diné person, um, so this is not your tribal story, but how did you come to uh, the people in the story and to, to, to learn about this ceremony that, um, you know, as they talk a little bit about in the trailer, had not been one that had kind of gone by the wayside and was being revived um, in present day? Yeah, um, so many questions in one, <laughs> but um, I would say that the first um, thing is Long Line of Ladies comes from the poem that is read by Uncle Brian. Um, and uh, if you watch the film, uh, it's towards the latter half of the movie. And so um, basically it's so ingrained in, in who they are. And I think um, something I really resonate with too, because um, being Navajo or Diné, um, we come from a matriarchal society. And so it's really... Uh, cool to see, I guess, that overlap between different tribes. And uh, again, uh, being Diné, there is a, a ceremony called a Kinalta, which is also a coming of age ceremony for a young woman. So I feel like this story to me is intrinsic in a way, but still so different. And there's still a lot of listening and learning to be had. And um, the first person who uh, made contact, I, or I guess like reached out to Pim, which is uh, Pim Allen, who is the mother, of Ati uh, was Rika, and so that was uh, a while ago, I would say probably early last year. And basically she um, she was working on a project beforehand called Period End of Sentence with the PAD project that has to deal with uh, the stigmas of menstruation. And so she kind of wanted to do something else that was surrounded by, um, I guess, a community and how they uplift young women um, during a time like this. And so she was, studying and uh, I guess like looking around and she found uh, Pim on Facebook and reached out to her. And then after that, um, just a lot of communication and a lot of talking about what our intention was. It's a fascinating story. I think, you know, it, in many ways, I mean, one, the celebration of this you know, very important time of life for young women, um, but also destigmatizing it. And what I found interesting just from watching the trailer, and it, certainly this would be the, the story in, in the tribe, is that there's so many men involved. Typically when we talk about menstruation, if we talk about it at all, certainly in the United States, it's a, you know, it's a women's ceremony. It's, it's you know, passed down from mother to daughter, but men really aren't involved. So maybe you can talk a little bit about that, that it is, it seems like it's, it's the community as a whole, right? Writ large, men and women, young and old, not just about the women kind of off by themselves, you know, celebrating this very, you know, perhaps unseemly, you know, in some, uh, um, you know, cultures, um, but obviously very important. This is how we're all made, you know, these are how humans are made. So maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, it's something that's so deep inside of their culture and um, even the story of Dear Woman, which is what the hook is based on, um, has members of the family who are men, like uncles and dads and that sort of thing. And so it's very integral to who they are as a people to involve a whole entire um, community rather than just singling one person out. And I think also like, um, I guess like from my own experience, uh, like the idea of a young woman getting her period is a very individualized concept. And it's something that um, I guess like creates this barrier between, I guess, the rest of the community. And so uh, what they're doing is a very uh, against westernized concepts. And I think it's so um, true of a lot of indigenous peoples. They try to surround as much people as they can within uh, the community to try and uplift each other. And I think uh, it's something that we could all learn from for sure. I think it's really important to be involving men in these ideas because you can't necessarily change the ideas of anything if half of the people in the world are men and they are also contributing to the conversation. Absolutely, and just empowering young women to embrace this part of their life. You know, it is central to how, again, how all of us are born. Um, what I love also about the clip is that you integrate um, the modern world with, you know, with ancient 
traditions, you know, that she's Snapchatting about, you know, getting her period, and then just when you're talking about how the film was discovered, uh, that it was discovered on Facebook. So I thought that was kind of interesting. How did you come to, to work together uh, with Rika? Yeah, um, I mean, I, I wish Rika was here for the conversation. I think she's about to hop in pretty soon, but um, it was so different. I think it, it's difficult. Um, I mean, I've always worked in indigenous film, and so I think everything that I know about a lot of uh, the subject matter and like how I would approach this is so inherent to me. But I think having to join forces and like, and uh, use like Rika's incredible artistry and creativity to help, um, I guess, like sustain this idea and create something that was so much bigger than ourselves is something that we always had to keep mind on. And I think like, we're both very strong headed and we, we love our art and we love our form of expression. And so I think it was, lots of conversations, lots of trying to understand each other's ideas and really like just realize that like the family is the center of this whole entire story and we want to do them justice and we want them to be proud of this film. And so to do that was to like set aside some ideas, but also just like really try to find common ground and find like the heart in everything and and mostly just sit back and listen, I think. Well, congratulations, Shandin Tome and Rika Zabtachi. Um, Long Line of Ladies will be premiering in the nonfiction short section of this year's Sundance Film Festival. We will be right back. Welcome back. Right now we are going to focus on the Indie Entertainment Showcase happening virtually during the festival this year. And we have a panelist joining us today, Bobby Dyer. She's executive producer of a film coming out this spring called Breakthrough, A Mental Health Journey. So excited that Bobby's here with us today. How are you doing? I'm doing just wonderful. Thank you so much for hosting me. It's a pleasure. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing more about this panel and about you and your film that's coming out and your background. Let's start with the Indie Entertainment Showcase in general. For you, what is this all about? Uh, first of all, I'm just thrilled and honored to be part of Sundance Film Festival and to be part of the Indie um, the Festival. The showcase is just going to be incredible. You've got five incredible panelists there from all different backgrounds. And the interesting thing about it is that you'll see a wide range of ideas and and, and new things and things that are just very exciting to see in today's market. And for you, who would you say that this showcase is specifically aimed at? What people would be interested in participating and being a part of this virtual event? It's really for anybody that's interested in the film business or just interested in seeing movies and documentaries and things that make a difference in the world. I'd encourage anybody, whether you've made a film or been part of a film or just interested in films to take a listen and um, really get some great information and see some of the new things that are coming on. And Bobby, how did you get involved with this? What has been your interaction with Indie Entertainment Showcase and what made you really want to do this? Uh, it was an honor and a privilege to be contacted by Indie Entertainment to be able to do this. And I can't tell you how thrilled I am. Um, the reason I got in the more mu music business or music business, it should be the music business and the movie business was um, my son died two years ago. He had some mental health issues and sadly he passed away from some accidental contact with fentanyl. But there's such a need for mental health services in this country and the personal stories that people tell are really, really compelling. So about two years ago, I met with Josh Painter and Joshua Adams and Justin Snyder and the four of us decided that we could make a difference by making a documentary that uh, follows different stories and different pe people's paths in life. Uh, we follow a gal that had an eating disorder and what her journey was, and uh, she's in New York City. We followed a young lady in Los Angeles that was assaulted. We follow a gentleman from Austin, Texas uh, that was in the military, and then we follow an athlete. So we have all races, all different ages, all different sexes, and I think people find it very compelling. And we actually have a trailer of this film coming out this Wonderful. spring. So we're gonna take a look at that trailer right now. Thank you. There is no doubt in my mind, there is a mental health crisis in the United States today. Alcoholism, drug abuse, gambling disorders, eating disorders, sexual addiction, just running rampant. Social media, instant gratification, high levels of hypervigilance and stress that society has gone in, political conflict. It's downplayed, people don't like talking about it, people don't think it's that important. People minimize mental health. It's not if you're gonna have a mental health issue in your life, it's when. There's this tidal wave of 
brokenness and pain and issues that is coming at us in the field. And unless we work together, we're gonna see it overtake us. Healing is a journey, it's a process, it's a lifelong journey and process. Just like you think about your physical health and staying healthy, how many times do you go to the gym up here? Mental health is a journey. Journeys aren't always straightforward and it is something that is human. There's always a light. And sometimes if the light's not around you, sometimes you gotta be the light. so grateful that you are shining a light and this Thank film you. on individuals who struggle with mental health. It is so common and I feel that we still have a long way to go to reduce stigma and help people understand. I'm very grateful that you are sharing so many different types of stories because I think the more we share these stories, the more we can help make a difference for people. When you think back to the time that your son was struggling with his mental health, is this the type of resource, the type of film that you wish you could have had and that he could have seen? Absolutely. Um, you know, there's the saying, if I knew then what I knew now, it could never have been truer. Um, in the movie, we actually teach people things that we want them to know that there's help available, but there's also things that you can do in your everyday life. For example, instead of saying to somebody, how are you? Because everyone just answers fine. You can say to somebody, tell me how you're doing. Let them open up a little bit to you. And we'd like to try to help people have little problems, not become big problems. So there's a lot of educational piece in the film as well, which we're very excited to share. And I don't want to give too much away, but when you are participating in this panel, how exactly are you preparing? And what type of insight will you share with the audiences that will be participating in this virtual entertainment showcase? Well, um, a lot of it is what we want to do is give some people the basics. We want to share with them the basics of how we made the movie, of why we made the movie, of the compelling stories. I think everybody can relate to something in the story. And like I say in the movie, it's not if you're going to have a mental health issue in your life, it's when. Everyone is going to lose someone or go through something tough, and it's okay. It's okay to not be okay. And we want to share the resources that are available to people. And we want them to know they're not alone. People that are right next to you are, are going um, through the same things, through similar things, and that they're not alone. So we want them to know that it's okay. You can get through it. There's resources available. And uh, like at the end of the movie, it says, at the end of the trailer, it says, um, sometimes if there isn't a light around you, sometimes you have to be the light. And Bobby, you are actually in the financial business world. I'd love to hear a little more about your journey in becoming an executive producer and being able to make that bridge between what you do during your day job, which you're very successful <laughs> at, to being a part of this film world. Thank you, thank you. Um, yeah, I've been in the mortgage business over 30 years. I actually have uh, three other companies besides this. And the mortgage business prepares you for some mental health issues because it's such a struggling, such a struggle to be in the mortgage business and there's a lot of ups and downs and I take it very seriously. So my journey started with using my experience in the mortgage business and in management and understanding relating to people. I, I drew on that experience a lot, along with the training that I've had for many years. And Nicole with the showcase, uh, she was a wonderful coach to me and, and helped me to, to get on board and to um, be able to present the information the best way that we can to people. So my journey started in the mortgage business and continues in the mortgage business. Dire Mortgage still has to be in business <laughs> to make this movie, but um, we're, just, we're just thrilled to, to be able to have a little bit of time off and work to work on this film as well. But, but uh, Spencer's Journey Productions is our film uh, company. And then a movie, of course, is Breakthrough, A Mental Health Journey. And I don't know if this is a bit premature, but do you anticipate working on more films after this? I've got the bug. Of course I'm going to work on more films. Um, I'd really love to turn it into a show uh, where we can document people's different mental health experiences every week. I found during my research um, women with postpartum depression, with parents that have lost a child or parents that have a terminally ill child. Um, what do you do if you're caging, car caring for an aging parent? I'm ca caring for a parent with Alzheimer's. So there's a lot of stories that are yet to be told and I would love to be able to be part of telling those stories. They're very compelling, people can relate to them, and I think we can make a difference with some of the endings of how things turn out. And I'm very much excited to hear more about these stories, to watch your film. How can we find out more about you? How can we make sure that we don't miss Breakthrough, a mental health journey, and also learn about the showcase coming up here during the festival? 
Um, well, we don't have a uh, official website or anything yet released, but they can always contact me on bobbydyer.com, B-O-B-B-I-E-D-Y-E-R.com. They can always contact me. We'll have some release dates and things uh, for it that way. And of course, the, the production is uh, Spencer's Journey Productions. The mental health journey will be released uh, hopefully very soon, and we'll have more announcements and where people can see it. But if you just remember the movie, Breakthrough, A Mental Health Journey, you'll be able to find us or we'll be able to find you. Well, thank you so much, Bobby Dyer, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time with us and that you're participating in this panel that's part of the Indie Entertainment Showcase here with the Sundance Film Festival. We'll be back with more right here on In the Can right after this. Welcome back. The ASCAP Music Cafe always has incredible performances during the Sundance Film Festival. This year they will be virtual performances and here to tell us all about his particular performance coming up is John Doe, singer, songwriter, musician, co-founder of the band X. John, thanks for being here today. How are you? Oh, we're live. Yes. Hello. I'm here. Um, I'm doing pretty good. How about you? Doing great. Yes, we are live. Thank you for being here a little bit early, but we are excited to hear about your performance. Tell me more about what made you decide to participate in this. Well, um, as usual, it, it started with Loretta Munoz saying, hey, do you want to come and perform? Which she's done a few times in the past. It's always been a gas. Um, you know, you, you just get asked and you're foolish if you don't say yes. Let me in. And tell me a little bit about how this has had to change and transition. Of course, live music has been greatly impacted by this pandemic. And unfortunately, we were still looking forward to having the film festival in person. That changed. How do you feel about the virtual performance and how that's being done? And is that hard for you to perform that way? Or have you gotten used to it? Oh, uh, well, we've been lucky enough to exit uh, a, a uh, West Coast Christmas tour, and at the end of it, uh, over half of us got Omicron. Uh, Omicron. Uh, so uh, I, I feel very conflicted about playing live again. Um, it was definitely a learning curve, uh, getting used to, to to just performing into a camera and having no response and having no uh, like energy exchange. After the second or third time, you, you start getting used to it, but it's. It's difficult because there's a lot of energy going one way and, and nothing coming back. So you just got to do it. And tell me more about this particular performance with the Sundance Music Cafe with ASCAP. Do you have a set list yet? Do you know what songs you'll be performing? Well, I, I, I think I'm just going to do uh, a couple songs. Um, one in particular, and I, I made a, a solo record during lockdown and, and during the deadly pandemic um it's called fables in a foreign land it's going to be on fat possum and uh coming out march through may we're going to release some singles march and april and then it'll be uh the physical will be available in in may that's very exciting congratulations i can't even imagine the challenges in creating an album during the pandemic but very excited that you'll be playing some of these new songs during this yeah. music cafe. If someone isn't familiar with your style of music, tell me a little bit more about that and some of your inspirations. Well, uh, you know, X is an original LA punk rock band. We started in 77. And then somewhere in the early 80s, maybe mid 80s, I realized that I could sing country western style, uh, singer songwriter, music and and be convincing you know um i've always told stories and i think that goes back to when i was a young real youngster uh listening to folk music and this new record fables in a foreign land is uh my version of a folk record uh and you're talking about the challenges of, of making a record well <clears throat> this record started by this uh bass player friend of mine kevin smith who plays with willie nelson he and I getting together on his patio because we couldn't go inside. And, and I think it was probably April of 2020. We just started getting together once a week because neither one of us were touring. And, and uh, so it, be, it was very um, organic in that way. And I'm glad you brought up your time when you were younger. When you think back to before you went to LA, before you started in the music business, 
how did that time impact you becoming a musician and becoming this artist? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm of a certain age that, that I was lucky enough to have, a, you know, a, a great experience with radio and FM music became, uh, you know, a thing when I was uh, a teenager, you know, a young teenager. So um, it was just, there were all kinds of music all mashed together, uh, but, but not, <laughs> there wasn't, there weren't country songs that had a rap uh, middle part, a, a rapping bridge, uh, but there were <laughs> country songs and R&B songs kind of next to each other on the radio. Um, I, I didn't think I was going to have a career as a musician <clears throat> until probably 1985 or 86 after X had put out three or four records. Uh, you know, you, you always think it can get snatched away from you. <clears throat> so uh, I was just, <laughs> I'm very, very fortunate to, to, uh, to be here, A, just to be here, <laughs> and B, to uh, actually have some sort of a career. And do you recall any specific artists that you enjoyed listening to growing up that you really were inspired by and wanted to, in some ways, emulate, but you bring in your own style, absolutely? Oh, um, well, when I was really young, I wanted to be Lead Belly, and, and that was kind of off the table. I didn't, <laughs> I didn't want to go to jail for murder. Um, <clears throat> and uh, Woody Guthrie it was, a, it was a big influence in the early days. And then... Um, I'd say probably The Doors, uh, you know, Jim Morrison's writing and, and their whole uh, attachment to the blues. And then, you know, luckily we got to work with Ray Manzarek for, as a producer for four records. So, you know, I've <clears throat> long and storied, but really it's, uh, it's about input, you know. If uh, someone told me recently, if you're having trouble with your output, then look at your input, you know, if you need things coming in in order to make things going out. So it's, it's uh, ever evolving. Oh, we mentioned you're a songwriter, but you're also a very well-known poet and you teach workshops on poetry. Tell me about those two <laughs> different ways of expression, the songwriting and the poetry. <clears throat> well, I mean, good lyrics, whether they're, you know, Hank Williams or uh, Chuck Berry, um, they're, they can be a poem and, uh, they're like a, a poem is distilled, um, feeling and event so that it, it, uh, says a lot in a, in very few words. Um, I don't really teach workshops so much as I, I am part of a workshop, some, some old, uh, poet friends from Antioch college back in Baltimore. And, um, I just started doing that during the pandemic too, which is pretty exciting. You have to come up with a poem once a month. Um, but uh, it's hard to say which is a, you know, what's just a piece of writing and what becomes a poem or what becomes a, a lyric. I think it has to do with uh, the rhythm and the meter of, of the words and uh, whether you hear a melody behind them or beneath them, that's what will decide. Where do you find your inspiration for writing, whether it's a poem or a song? Is it in everyday life, nature? If you really maybe are stuck in a rut and want to find a poem or find a song, what do you do to be able to create those and get out of a writer's block? What's your inspiration? Oh, you have to listen. You have to listen and, uh, and, and if you listen hard enough, then, then words will start coming. And, and if you uh, can get off your phone uh, and, and stop looking at some sort of a screen, then you'll get bored enough to start hearing things. Um, but, uh, you know, for this last record, I, it, it just started coming out that, that all these songs were taking place in a, in a pre-industrial era. So there, I wasn't referencing telephones or cars or anything modern. And then, and then it was like a challenge. Okay, you're going to make a, a whole record where it's a journey, uh, sort of a hero's journey. Could be a man or a woman, uh, and but it's all taking place in like the 1890s. So I had to stay focused on that, and it's a bit of a concept record. But uh, you know, that's that's why we also just used these sort of folk instruments, drums and 
upright bass and acoustic guitar. And John, how can we connect with you and listen to your music and make sure to not miss out on this new album coming out this spring? Uh, thejohndoe.com with two E's because I'm very, uh, you know, uh, the, thou, and, and, uh, <laughs> um, and the John Doe was taken. So, uh, yeah, just look up John Doe. I'm around. I'm on the, I'm on the inter, internet out there. And anything else you want to say about your performance? It's coming up tomorrow night at 5 p.m., virtually, of course, through the Sundance ASCAP Music Cafe. Uh, it should be fun. You know, I'm gonna gonna go out there and 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 do uh, do some cool stuff. Well, looking forward to that. Thank you so much, John Doe, for joining us today. It's been a pleasure meeting you, learning more about you, your music, your poetry, all the things. Be sure to head to Sundance Film Festival's website. You can find out more about the ASCAP Music Cafe, how you can watch virtually. And once again, John will be performing with some other artists tomorrow night at 5 p.m. We'll be back with more right here on In the Can after this. And we are back with In the Can here with Katie Wang. Very grateful that she agreed to co-host with me today. We've already talked about some incredible films and events all around the Sundance Film Festival. How do you feel, Katie? Great, I'm excited that Sundance is back. I know it's, well, it's a different format, similar to last year, um, but my dog and I get to settle in. We call it our Barker Lounger, um, and we get to watch lots of great films over the next 10 days. So I think I have about 35 queued up, so. That's a lot of film it's watching. It's a lot of film watching, yes, yeah, so <laughs> I'm excited. Which is what you do as part of your job with Park City Film. How does this translate, the films that you watch, with how you program throughout the year? Well, it's interesting. So when I first moved to Park City about 15 years ago, I, yeah, I've always been a, a lover of independent cinema, and I would go to film festivals, and I'm so excited to move to the home of Sundance, and I would always seek out the films that weren't gonna get distribution, right? It's like that hidden gem that will never see the light of day, you know, be that on the inside track, and of course, now now that I program films for a theater, I have to pick the films that are a little bit more, not mainstream, because that's not really what Sundance is about, um, but kind of have broader appeal. So I'm looking at films in a slightly different way. So it is a little bit of a mix of kind of films that are close to my heart, um, but then also films that I feel will resonate with the people of Park City and that I can bring back, hopefully, right? Because sometimes if you find these great films, sometimes they don't get distribution, unfortunately, and then it really is hard to bring them back. Although over time, I've gotten to know some of the filmmakers and some of the distributors, and so sometimes you're able to, to make things work behind the scenes to get them on the screen. So it's just interesting. It's interesting how my job has evolved, but also how my film watching has evolved. Um, and certainly this year with Sundance Festival program, I mean, it's so diverse and so interesting. I mean, just the stories that are reflective of our times, but also kind of leading us into the future, which I think is interesting. Um, and not as many kind of big, big name films as they've had. You know, there are a couple of years of kind of ebbs and flows. Sometimes it's a lot of really big films, and sometimes it's really much smaller films. And this year seems to be more emerging filmmakers, smaller stories in that sense, um, but important stories. So it's exciting. It is exciting, and you always pick really incredible films that resonate with the community here in Park City. So I think that's another aspect that you must consider when choosing what to program for Park City Film is what the priorities, what our community cares about as well. Absolutely, and it's also providing a window on the world. I mean, that's what our audience tells us time and time again is that with Park City Film, with the films that we bring in, it's a way to experience other communities and cultures and kind of travel, particularly now, travel around the world in ways that we aren't able to do as much as we used to be able to, but to experience, have experiences that are different than our own. So it is about um, kind of being close to the comfort zone of the people in Park City and what really resonates with them, but again, also providing that challenge, because that's the joy of independent cinema, of course, that there is that intellectual engagement. It's not just, you know, no offense, it's not just a Marvel movie, you know, big action kind of um, storylines, but it's thoughtful, it, it's exciting in its own way, but it's provocative, right? And that's, that's what's also something that we, we look for as I'm looking at these films and what our community looks for as they come to see our films. And here we are on the first day of the Sundance 2022 Film Festival. It's hard to believe you know, that has that virtual format. So hopefully more people from all over the world can tune in and enjoy these great films. What are some that you're looking forward to in particular? Uh, well, of course, lots of films. I've got 35 queued up, so <laughs> kind of have a mix, but kind of looking over the, you know, the expanse of them. Uh, we just showed the film being the Ricardos over Christmas. 
um, about Lucy, uh, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz. And of course, there's now a documentary about it with Amy Poehler's directing um, called Lucy and Desi. And I'm really fascinated to see, because you just got a flavor of them in being the Ricardos. It was just one week of their life. But to really see, I mean, they were so revolutionary. You know, growing up watching I Love Lucy, you didn't under, I didn't certainly appreciate how groundbreaking they were, just in what they were depicting on the screen, how they were depicting it, and kind of how they've changed television, right, media in general. So I'm really excited about that film. Um, there's a couple of films coming overseas, uh, one from Japan called Blood, which is a fantastic film um, that's really just about kind of finding yourself. Um, so, I don't know, there's like all these different films that I can, you know, get excited about. Um, I Didn't See You There, uh, which is about ability and disability, and really it's the filmmaker, you know, launches from a, um, he's inspired by a circus tent that's put up outside of his house. And so he comes back and, um, you know, looks at, you know, addresses issues of um, kind of a meditation about what it means to be visible or invisible, right? About ability, disability, kind of the perceptions of that, which I think is for our time certainly quite relevant and something that'll be really interesting to see how he depicts that. Um, and then of course, as a child of the 90s, I have to see nothing compares about Sinead O'Connor. <laughs> Just how groundbreaking she was and the reaction to her and really a re-examination of some of the um, kind of the pushback that she faced and kind of what that means with her music. So, so many films I could go on and on and on, but those are kind of the ones that are kind of bubbling to the top for me right now. Yeah, there's some that I'm very much looking forward to. One of them is The Princess. I don't know if that's on your list. Yes, yep, absolutely. I mean, how could you not want to see something about Princess Diana? I did see Spencer earlier this year. That's not a mm -hmm. film that we brought in, um, which is kind of an interesting take, you know, different take on um, Diana and the royal family. It was basically a weekend of their lives. So yeah, just curious to see how that story evolves. I am. Um, a British ascent, a, a card-carrying member of the <laughs> citizen of the British Empire. So, of course, the royal family is always something I follow. But, yeah, looking forward to that. That one, it sounds like, is a very introspective film where it's not only about her life, but it turns kind of the dialogue towards us and how the world also inevitably impacted that. So I think it's going to be one that people are talking about for sure. Yeah, well, the royal family has been interesting. I mean, certainly, you know, citizens of the United Kingdom are always following the royal family, but I mean, the world is so captivated. They were so captivated by Diana and now by, um, you know, by her children. And just kind of that, again, it's a little bit, and with, again, with cinema, that you can experience the world and perhaps your own life differently by watching other people's lives. There's something cathartic about that, right? By seeing the trauma that has ensued through that family, and they're so different from us, but yet they're so much like us at the same time, kind of trapped in their gilded cage, that there is this kind of odd fact. It's like you can't look away, but I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that. So. Um, definitely. Another one that I feel like is getting quite a bit of buzz, I don't know if you're hearing the same thing, is hatching. Have you heard about that one? Um, so there's, it's interesting that, that you say that, that you bring that one up, because there are, normally you have the horror films kind of designated to the midnight section, but there are a lot more in the mainstream um, kind of sections of the festival. So I've heard a little bit about Hatching. I'm, I like horror films, I kind of grew up with them. It's not uh, films that we typically program a lot, but yeah, I'm curious to see what that one's all about. That one is about a young girl who finds an egg and helps to have it hatch, but it's a very, <laughs> it's hard to really describe, but it's a, what you see from what they put out so far with promoting this film is this young girl in her bedroom with an enormous egg. And so you have to wonder what's hatching in that. So I know I'm looking forward to that one as well. And we'll actually be interviewing their director here too. Oh, nice. That'll be fun. Yeah. Well, there's another one called The Duel. Um, artificial intelligence is something that there are a couple of films about that, but it's kind of bubbling up in the film world. Um, and this is basically this woman creates you know, her, not even her avatar, but the facsimile of her because she has a, um, uh, fatal disease, but she ends up miraculously recovering from it. And so she's now like, well, wait, now there's this duplicate of me, right, that's out in the world, but I'm still here. So what do I do with this other person that's supposed to be me in the world? And so basically the judgment is that they have to duel to the death. <laughs> so very, kind of that horror bent of it, you're like, interesting, but also that interesting thing of like creating, you know, what is, what is identity, right? And there's, you know, a couple of films that are about that of just, um, you know, After Yang is another one where they you know, have this robot basically that they buy for their child and kind of what that does to their lives. So it's kind of fascinating to see that we're, we're taking that almost supernatural bent in filmmaking.
the okay. film's coming through. And another film that I've heard, Good Luck to You, Leo Grand with Emma Thompson, mm -hmm. sounds like that really examines that stage of life that maybe some people just dismiss and it brings on some new life to to that time. And I'm looking forward to seeing Emma Thompson in a completely different role than I think she's been in before. But also some of the films that you discussed today, Long Line of Ladies, I like these themes of kind of changing the narrative and making sure that people's stories are being heard and told. Absolutely, and bringing it to the forefront. I mean, certainly with Long Line of Ladies, I mean, this is a topic when you talk about coming of age ceremonies, right? Usually it's kind of a sanitized version of that, if you will, but to really look at kind of more deeply into it and the culture that's around it and looking at some of these stories. You know, there's such a deep culture in our country with indigenous people, but they're varied, right? It's not like each one is the same, each tribe has a different way of addressing it. But some of these ceremonies have been lost over time, right, for modernization or for whatever reason, but it's, it's fascinating and exciting to see their revival and how it looks in modern times. How do you update something that's been around for thousands of years, but is still happening? And how do you bring that into the present day and reinforce it and empower the next generation to take that history with them? That it's not just the past, you know, young kids are like, meh, it's the past, I don't wanna do that. It's like, but that's where you're from, like that's who you are. How do you bring that history with you into the future and create something that includes that, but also is something that's your own, that's uniquely your own. And so I feel like we're kind of in that time, it's such a reflective time over the past couple of years. We've had so much time to ourselves, <laughs> um, whether we wanted to or not, that you do see that coming through with some of these films. I'm so looking forward to watching more and to talking to even more actors and directors right here during our show in the can throughout the festival. In fact, Katie will be back on Monday to do more interviews with that, us. Very much looking forward to that as well. Yes, me too. So between then and now, we have films to watch. Hope that you will make sure to tune in right here at 7 a.m. to In the Can, where we have even more conversations. And encourage you, if you can, to watch some of these films or make a list of films that you'd love to see after the festival. We'll keep you posted of how and when you can watch these. So thanks again, Katie, for being here. We're going to take a quick break and get back with more right here on In the Can after this. Welcome back right now. We're going to update you with our weather so you can be prepared for this change that's coming. Let's take a look outside actually at our beautiful chilly morning. Look at those blue skies. Looks to be a nice bluebird day today. We'll enjoy that because there's some snow coming in later on tonight. Currently it's only 11 degrees. It did feel quite cold this morning and frosty. Warming up to 29 degrees, partly cloudy skies, but right now skies are blue. Didn't see any clouds right there. And then tonight, later on, maybe around 7, 8, PM later on this evening time frame is when we'll start to see the snowfall throughout tomorrow morning. So 10 degrees is the low overnight. Let's take a look at tomorrow and the following day so you can know what to expect. They're calling for anywhere from one to six inches, more on the higher four to six inch side for the upper elevations in the resorts. So right here in Park City, it's looking to be between one and four inches tonight into tomorrow morning. So kind of a big range there. Just be prepared tomorrow morning. Give yourself some extra time and you know, don't forget, it's been a while since it snowed actually. So just remember to be ready and prepared for some winter driving conditions tomorrow and a little bit of powder on the slopes, which we're all very excited for. And then that moves out and we have another dry spell. So Saturday, the high is 28. That low is very chilly down to three. A little warmer on Sunday coming in at 31. The low is eight, very similar on Monday, the high being 30, and then Tuesday, a bit cooler, 27 is the high, the low is eight. It's looking to be somewhat dry until the end of the month. So we're really hoping maybe we can have this dry pattern followed up by a very active pattern like we saw in December, but so far we're not quite sure about that, but we'll keep you posted on all of that change. Another beautiful shot from our roof cam, blue skies abound right now. So I hope that you can get out and enjoy wherever you may be. We're gonna take a quick break and get back with some more in the can right after this.
And we've come to the end of our first day of our film festival show in the can. Covered quite a wide range of films and movies. Really appreciate the director of Babysitter, also a star of that film, for joining us today. You can find that one in the midnight selection of the film festival. Also really appreciate the director of Mars One being here. That's a world cinema dramatic category within the festival. And also Long Line of Ladies, which is part of the nonfiction shorts program. So few different films that we covered today. Also great to talk with Bobby Dyer, part of the Indie Entertainment Showcase that you can make sure to participate in virtually. Also looking forward to hearing more about her film, Breakthrough, A Mental Health Journey. And thanks to John Doe of X. He'll be performing with the ASCAP Music Cafe. We'll be back tomorrow with more in the can, more films, directors, stars, all the things. So in the meantime, have a great day. See you next time.